Hello. Wouldst thou be inclined to destroy God through the use of a complicated magic system and with the help of a diverse yet strangely archetypal gang of teenagers? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. Agreeable. Let us... Forsooth? I said I don't think I do. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm too busy streaming on twitch.tv slash ginzy five days a week, four hours a day. Kudelka is a JRPG, but I wouldn't call it a traditional one. Full disclosure, I was going to do a video on Shadow Hearts initially, but immediately found out that Kudelka was its predecessor. So, curious, I decided to play it. This game surprised me in that I expected one thing and never got it. The standard JRPG tropes were largely missing. We did not kill God by the end, the magic system was very simple, the cast is not made up of a gang of quirky teenagers, and in all technicality, we don't even really save the world. Despite the general story, this tale is actually rather small in scope and personal. Perhaps that's why I enjoyed it very much. Maybe you will too. I will now proceed to spoil the entirety of the story in Kudelka. You are warned. So, gather round the fire and let me tell you a tale. Nemeton Monastery, Wales. It has a storied history going back many centuries, but for now, all you need to know is that it was built by Saint Daniel Scotius, after the man consecrated the land. For Nemeton Monastery was a place of great power, and so held the potential for great sorrow. Indeed, not long after its creation, it was turned into a political prison. Here, all those who spoke out against the powers that be were locked away forever, to be executed eventually. In so doing, the place was soaked in malice over time, and raging ghosts would haunt its corridors long after the monastery was once again abandoned. Enter Petrick Hayworth and his wife, Elaine. They were a happy couple, and Elaine seemed a picture of purity. One day she met a man called Ogden Hartman, the disgraced captain of a pleasure boat, the Princess Alice. That boat sank in a terrible accident, and Ogden, the only survivor, was blamed for the event. He began to drink heavily while obsessively painting pictures of the boat in a vain attempt to process his survivor's guilt. No one believed in his innocence, no one except Elaine. She not only believed him, but she and Patrick took Ogden and his wife Bessie into service. He found happiness for a time. Until one night, when both Patrick and Ogden were out of the house, thieves broke in and killed Elaine. Patrick, enraged and distraught over the death of his wife, Ogden, now pressed with ever more guilt over his inability to protect her, together sought to do right their perceived wrongs. Something they finally thought possible when Patrick obtained the Imigre document, an ancient manuscript written by the Four Moors, a race long gone, said to hold the secret of resurrection. In 1985, Patrick, Ogden and Bessie moved into the Nemeton Monastery to prepare for the grand ritual that would bring back their beloved Elaine. While trying to decipher the Emigre document, Patrick found himself slipping ever further towards the darkness. In the monastery he found the Cauldron of Life, from which the Tree of Life would sprout, the Tree of Life that would hold Elaine reborn. To achieve this, the Cauldron would require sacrifices of flesh and blood. Initially, Patrick would attempt to appease the Cauldron with animal offerings, but that would not do. The spirits surrounding these holes were not pleased so easily, only humans would do. Patrick hesitated, but certainly not for long, even as he was aware that God's wrath would no doubt be upon him as he tread this path further into darkness, he persisted. April 3rd, 1896. Storm. Oh dear lord, I have without a doubt committed a crime no human should have committed. I conducted the druid experiment using the flesh and blood of the victims. I sensed the incredible energy of the spirits culminate into one when I poured the woman's remains into the cauldron. As I had thought before, it is human flesh that needs to be offered up to fully release the effects of the procedures. What a frightening, arcane process this is. The sounds of fury in the woman's death screams have not left my ears, but I must go on. There is no turning back now. April 12th, 1896. Rain. Once again, I perform the procedures. I once again round up four victims from London. 
even though they are all old with barely a thing to live for. When I contemplate taking their lives, it leaves me sick to my stomach. It may be due to my doubts that the spirits did not rise to such a powerful strength as before. I may have to use a younger, more vibrant source of energy. The book says to fill the cauldron with energy of haunted spirits. I wonder how many victims the cauldron must swallow to be satisfied. The cauldron proves itself a ravenous monster, as victim after victim is devoured by the thing. Still, it is not enough. Ogden, as far gone as his master, offers to buy slaves to sacrifice instead. Something Patrick goes along with, and as time goes by, Patrick loses grip on reality entirely. Eventually, noting down his murders in the same way as one might list mundane household tasks. October 3rd, 1896. Rain. Butchered three bodies this morning. After lunch, we made repairs to the bell tower of the main church. After dinner, with Bessie and Odgen, I butchered three more bodies. The lab table has proven its worth. October 14th, 1896. Rain. Six bodies butchered in the morning, five in the afternoon, one after dinner. Finally, on November 1st, All Saints' Day, enough souls had been gathered, nearly 200 of them. Patrick commenced the ritual and succeeded in growing the Tree of Life, whose bloom at the top contained a lane reborn, except... The creature he resurrected was but the shell of his dead wife. Patrick's ritual had torn Elaine's soul from the afterlife and bound her to this place, unable to find rest, while her body, newly resurrected, was merely a ravenous beast that killed Patrick after he, despairing at the sight of her, offered himself to her. Granted, I'm not entirely sure what Patrick thought might happen, given the Imigre document itself and the tasks therein described, it wasn't difficult to guess at the outcome. Well, my wife is dead, but I do have this book here shaped like an actual human skull that was stolen from the Vatican specifically for me and hidden away by them for years for one reason or another. Uh, it says here that it, uh, it contains the secret to reanimation and all I have to do is sacrifice a lot of creatures flesh and blood to an inanimate object. Well, nothing can go wrong here, can it? Ah! Well, nevertheless. Patrick had only succeeded in completing half the ritual, resulting in an empty vessel that looked like his wife. This is where Kudelka comes in, the title of the game. Elaine's spirit, now stuck as a ghost in a Nemeton monastery, calls out to Kudelka, who is a powerful medium with various magical powers herself. Kudelka, answering the call, makes her way to Nemeton exactly two years after Patrick resurrected Elaine. Or rather, a day early, on October 31st, 1898. It probably behooves me to introduce our main characters to you first, as their stories get somewhat convoluted when told in parts throughout the game. The main character, Kudelka Yasant, is a Romani girl and her real name is Slata, which means treasure, according to her. She's been in possession of some rather powerful magical powers since birth, predicting her father's place and time of death early in her life. Her powers spread fear amongst her people, and her mother feared her so deeply that she'd even tried to kill Kudelka. This led to her eventual exile from her people at only nine years old. She begged and sold her body to get by, and only felt good about living when she used her powers to help others. In the end, all she wanted was for her life to have meaning and for someone to need her. For this reason, she found herself drawn to the monastery to free Elaine. Our second main character is a man called Edward Plunkett. He was born to a wealthy family in London and grew up under the pressure of great expectations. Unfortunately for his father, Edward wasn't much of an academic. He liked to dream and read poetry. Instead of becoming a distinguished professor, Edward chose to drop out of university to roam the world in an attempt to find meaning in his life. The only reason he ventured into the Nemeton Monastery was the call of a new adventure and perhaps riches to boot. The third and final main character is James O'Flaherty. If you couldn't tell, of course he's from Ireland. 
His family wasn't rich, but managed to send James to school regardless where the boy flourished. As he continued his studies, he met Patrick Hayworth. Yes, the Patrick Hayworth that enjoys summoning dead wives. They became fast friends until that friendship broke apart when they both fell in love with Elaine Spencer. Convinced that his low status would never be enough for Elaine, James conceded to Patrick, who was rich enough to give her all she needed. Heartbroken, he joined the Catholic Church and quickly made it to the rank of bishop. When several priceless tomes were stolen from the Vatican, two priests were called upon to find them and bring them back. James was one of them. After some fruitless searching, he realized that his old friend Patrick was likely in possession of at least one of the tomes, the Emigre document. And so, off he goes to investigate his friend in the Nemeton Monastery. So, those are our three main protagonists. That doesn't tell you a whole lot about their personality, I'm sure, so allow me to show you. Why all those liars and heathens are killed is none of my concern. How could you possibly say a thing like that? That doesn't sound very priestly. I am not a priest. I am a bishop. I don't give a rat's ass what you are. Look, I'm not saying that all of those people were saints, okay? But that doesn't mean that they should be put to death. You saw that old couple. They're so well-mannered, kind. You think they're killers? Good manners? Yes. Think about it. Why would they leave the place such a mess? I don't know. You think they'd at least bury the body? Possibly. Anyway, I have this strange feeling we're not alone with all these bodies and ghosts. You'd better keep your mouth shut. If you want to live. And if you think I'm kidding with the James thing, allow me to show you a sample of James and some of his more impressive moments. Especially when people are dying from hunger every single day in London. Oh, they're all filthy anymore, little beggars that deserve to die. Will you shut up and get us out of here? How hard can it be for thieves like you to get us out of a place like this? How could such a kind and faithful couple be cold-blooded killers? This is the work of jealousy and greed. And pagans born of savagery, immigrants. You're obviously a dirty immigrant thief. Probably infected with cholera or something most of you are. I'm on a mission from God. Anyway, I do not like this. And this gang of misfits eventually teams up to beat up all the monsters haunting the monastery. The battle system is actually pretty interesting. You get to allocate your own stat points, one of which is luck, which they say is very useful, but I still don't believe them. You can move your characters around the battlefield, and some weapons require you to stand a little further away. Guns require actual bullets to use as well, and you will not need anything but magic. Yeah, I said it. Through the stat allocation system, I pumped up Kudelka's offensive stats to such a degree that at one point, she one-shot a boss. Literally. She used one spell, and it keeled over. And apparently, I was quite underleveled at the time. Every so often, James would also get to cast a spell because I turned him into a caster too, of course. But Edward... Oh, poor Edward. He was basically there for show. The combat is also rather slow. Animations take a while to complete, and after casting any spell, the game will wait to individually load in each character on the battlefield, which I was not a huge fan of, especially because the battlefield, as it was, didn't ever change much. It was always just the floor, accompanied by the black void of space for wallpaper. The monsters were generally just the same monsters over and over, using different color schemes apart from the bosses. And I really like the design of some of these bosses. They're genuinely gruesome in nature, like the chimera with its various heads, seemingly held together only by a solid stream of blood. They also each have descriptions, one's defeated, and some of them are quite sad, like the mummy bride. Dressed in fashions of a bygone age, she was a prisoner of the monastery until her sad and lonely death. Spurned by the man who loved her, she was left to rot in the prison. For cruel amusement, the guards forced her to wear her wedding dress and locked her away. Death is her only release. I do not like this. The gameplay isn't groundbreaking, certainly, but honestly, it's refreshing to see a combat system that, at the very least, isn't spam attack to grind enemies. It also isn't necessary. You don't need to grind levels to finish the game at all. It really focuses on the story and atmosphere, and atmosphere it has in spades. The game's old, obviously, so it isn't much to look at. Although, I still think it looks very good for its time, but I think that it works in its favor, as it does with most older games. 
I've often asked myself why I never get that same gritty horror feeling with new games. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I think I can now. Newer games simply look too clean. We see too much. And that's an odd thing to say, perhaps, because there's plenty of gore and dead bodies in more modern releases, but the higher pixel count always proved to smooth things over to such an extent that it didn't feel gritty. A lot of Kudelka's gameplay involves walking around various rooms, and those rooms are never fully explorable. You see a snapshot, and you walk around that snapshot, as with a lot of older games like Silent Hill 1 and 2. When was the last time a new horror release stopped you from taking a closer look at things? If Kudelka was a newer game, you would have zoomed in on the blood on that guillotine, perhaps? Taking a real good look at the blade, you'd be able to count the droplets, try to put your head in the hole for laughs. You can't do that in Kudelka and games like that. They don't allow you to break the atmosphere like that. You can't bunny hop onto the bloody altar or bug through a wall accidentally. And everything in those new games would be smooth. Not vague and fuzzy and slightly pixelated, like this area here. No, it's 60 FPS in 4K resolution. And I will admit that this is going to be different on a person-per-person -person basis, but for me, I can no longer get into the atmosphere of many of the newer games specifically because of this. I can get jump scared, sure, but there's never a sense of dread. I may well be desensitized after playing so many of them, but I have the same exact reaction to videotapes. I often wonder if that's what developers are trying to achieve by using the videotape medium so often in their new projects. Resident Evil 7 has you watch tapes of those who came before you. In Outlast, you walk around with a camcorder half the time. VHS tapes come with inherent grittiness. I'm old enough to have lived through the VHS generation, and let me tell you, those things degrade faster than you'd like. I think developers might feel the same way I do, that not showing everything, not zooming in on details too often, creates far more mystery and atmosphere than scary monsters popping in and out of frame ever could. Not that this is all Kudelka has to rely on. The sound work, in general, is also very good. As you walk around the house, sometimes the floorboards will creak above you as dust falls slowly from the ceiling. The rattling of chains can be heard as your steps echo through the halls, and music is not ever present. The only sound you'll hear for most of the game is your footsteps. Although what little music we do have is excellent, and the battle soundtracks are some of my favorites ever at this point. If this was a review, I would now list all the other quirky things Kudelka does, gameplay-wise, and go in-depth on the various oddities, but I shan't. I shall, however, vent one pet peeve of mine. Armor is for some reason so intensely rare that even with all the luck in the world, I only ever found a single piece throughout the entire game. I have no idea why they gave me an armor slot at this point. I do not like this. Now, back to the story. Kudelka breaks into the Nemeton Monastery to find Edward sitting on the floor slowly bleeding to death. He was attacked by a monster, and after swiftly saving him, we team up to explore the rest of the mansion. Monsters seem to be the only problem until we run into the caretaker couple, Ogden and Bessie. They offer our heroic team food and even some spare bullets, but Kudelka quickly realizes that they've poisoned the food. Edward who does not realize a thing, shovels everything down and even gets angry with Kudelka for refusing the food. You wasted all of that food. What's wrong with you? Yeah, if it weren't poison, then it would have had some. Pardon? I said, if the soup weren't poisoned, then I would have had some. Got it? Poison. Oh, right. The poison. The poison for Cusco. The poison chosen specially to kill Cusco. Cusco's poison. It doesn't take long for them to run into the final part of our trio, James, knocked out on the floor. After we entered the room, we were hit with a something's not right message, indicating there is a boss in the room. And after pummeling said boss, 
We are at last blessed by James's terrible personality. He will not miss any opportunity to call Kudelka and Edward thieves, pagans, and all manner of other things. One of his delightful traits is also not believing that the old couple has ill intentions. But despite all this, he joins the party immediately. I do not like this. Our next guest of honor is the main character of Kudelka's B plot. Yes, there's a B plot, that of Charlotte. You should have just died before. I wanted you to lay down and die. <laughs> a ghost? Charlotte, as you can probably tell, is the vengeful ghost of a young girl who died here in this prison. She was decapitated at nine years old on her very birthday. We can't do much about her right now, though, so instead we run into a pile of corpses in the very next room. As the tortured spirits of the dead still inhabit the room, Kudelka decides to contact them to find out what happened. What's going on? Oh, they were imprisoned and tortured and, oh, thousands of them. I killed them! They cut off my fingers, they crushed my legs, they smashed my head and cut out my guts! They took everything from me, they locked me up and chopped my body! Go! Go on my eyes! Oh, my ears! Oh, they're burned! Go! Help! A while later, our gang is well on their way with another thread of the mystery when ground gives way beneath them and they end up in a cell. Once there, Charlotte shows up a second time. Her story is something of a mirror to Kudelka's in a way, but since we're here, I might as well tell you a bit of her backstory too. Because Charlotte is one of those Western inserts. Something I find a lot of JRPGs do is grab random stories from the West to use in various other stories. Usually it's not significant, and it isn't in this case, but I hadn't heard of the story before, so I thought it interesting. Charlotte's mother is a woman nicknamed the Uncrowned Queen of Great Britain, Sophia Dorothea of Sel. Her story is a little long, so I'm going to summarize it here shortly. Oh no, my wife is of low birth and thus I cannot legally marry her, and our daughter, Sophia, is of low birth and technically a bastard. Oh no! I will break the rules and marry my peasant wife. My daughter is now a princess. Oh yeah! Now marry the future king of England. He hates your guts because you're technically still a peasant in his eyes, but he has to marry you because I'm paying him a lot of money. He also looks suspiciously like me because we are related by blood. Reasonably closely. Oh no. I hate Sophia, my peasant wife, but I have two children with her now, so I'm going to go out whoring. Oh no. I am Count Philip Christoph von Koningsmark, here to fill the hole in your heart. Oh yeah! Oh no! The courts found out that you were happy for mere moments! I am being assassinated for sure! Oh no! What? You egg! Oh no! I now have sufficient proof to show that you were trying to run away from me, your husband who continuously cheats on you. And for this, I will have you imprisoned for life and also scrub your name from the history. Oh no! Well, at least I still have Charlotte, the illegitimate child that I have with Philip, the only man I've ever loved. I will now proceed to write her many letters that she will never actually receive. Shut up! That's only in the video game. Ah! Well, nevertheless. Yes, Charlotte was Sophia and Philip's child. And despite Sophia's fervent letter writing, none of them ever reached the girl. She died with malice in her heart, and the only way to help her is to find her mother's letters pray at the young girl's grave, and then take the letters to little Charlotte's room where her ghost resides. In doing so, Charlotte is overwhelmed by emotions entirely alien to her, while without the letters in hand, Charlotte will turn into a monster, fighting Kudelka outright. But through the letters, she experiences love. For the first time ever, she felt loved. Charlotte. Do you know what these are? They're letters from your mother. My mother? Letters? There's so many! 
Did you know that your mother was a queen of Panover? It seems that after you were born in secret, your mother was locked up inside Alden Castle. Even while she was imprisoned there, she sent many letters to you here in the monastery. She never laid eyes on you, but she often imagined what you looked like. She dreamt of the day when she would be able to see you. Her letters never got to you, and she was never told of your death, so she continued to write you letters even after you died. Your mother loved you, Charlotte. What? what? No. no. I can't, I can't take, take this now. now. Should she love me? me? No. 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 It's, it's too, too scary. scary. Hey, hey, I feel, I feel warm. warm. What's, What's happening? happening? No. no. Help, Help me. me. You want me to bring you? Do you love me? me? I hate you. I hate you. you. Don't you break from me. You. 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 Charlotte. How does it feel to know you are loved? Even though she now has proof her mother loved her, Charlotte is unable to accept these emotions. All she's ever known was resentment, fear, and anger. Love is foreign to her, and it scares her all the more as she disappears forever to heaven at last. Charlotte is an interesting character to Kudelka especially because they are quite alike in many ways. Both had their lives ripped away from them at nine years old. Both had never felt loved by the people around them. Kudelka even admits that at one point, she too only wanted everyone else to just die. She felt a connection to the girl and mourned her passing earnestly. But Charlotte was not the only person working against them in the mansion. Another man, a thief, worked tirelessly to scare off or kill them. When he almost crushes them with a chandelier, the team has had enough. They confront and defeat him, where the man reveals that the caretaker couple, Ogden and Bessie, have been murdering every single burglar that came to the mansion so far, usually with poison, but sometimes brutally with an axe. It seems that even after Patrick's failed resurrection attempt, Ogden especially still felt he needed to atone for his sins. He did so by killing any and all trespassers. Look, the more wholesome they look on the outside, the colder and uglier the heart is. Just look at him! I do not like this. Edward mercilessly shoots the guy after this confession because, as he says, he did try to kill them too. And this is as good a time as any to bring up the voice acting, because the conversation held around this one thief really shows off how well done it really is. You're crazy if you believe this scoundrel. This killer's obviously executed hundreds of people. He needs to be turned into the police and judged in a proper forum. We're crazy. Why? Just because he's an immigrant? Or is it because he's one of the unsaved? That's bullying. You know it, you pig-headed old bigot. What I'm trying I to say is... I believe this guy. Thieves can be exceedingly honest, you know? The conversations in Kudelka feel real. They interrupt each other, bicker, raise their voices believably. There are no awkward stops to sentences so the other person can pretend to interrupt them. They even talk through each other from time to time. You know, like real people do. I had not expected the voice work to be this good in such an old game. I'm sure we all remember the various awkward voice acting in these types of games from ye olden time. I was a little surprised to see that the voice actors for this game never found any other work afterwards. At most, a few of them had one other minor role, which amused me especially because the follow-up to this game, Shadow Hearts, definitely did not have voice acting of this level. The trio continue their exploration once again, and through a vision induced by one of Ogden's many paintings of the Princess Alice, Kudelka is introduced to the tragedy of this ship and its crew. In yet another room afterwards, Kudelka also receives a vision of Patrick's experiments, where the Kabbalah is prominently featured. The Kabbalah, of course, is also known as the Tree of Life, and consists of ten sefirot. No, not that one. They represent the various aspects of existence, God or the human psyche. Because, yes, there are different types of Kabbalah available, dating back many years before the Christian fate, which this particular Kabbalah seems to represent. The Tree of Life is used often in a lot of Japanese media, 
Probably the most well-known version to the wider public is the one used in Evangelion. And in seemingly both cases, they imply that the user is meddling with powers beyond their scope, playing God, as it were. We feeble mortals were not meant to utilize the idea of the Tree of Life in such a way, and it always backfires, so too in this case. Kudelka is shown Patrick's failure and his eventual death, but that's never stopped anyone, point in case. Roger Bacon. Venturing ever further into the monastery, they run into what seems to be a corpse, except it isn't. They find Roger Bacon, ancient warlock and once holy man. Specifically, the holy man who took the original Emigre document and copied it, as the first was falling apart. Upon completion of this copy, the Pope immediately ordered Bacon killed to preserve the secret to immortality. But Bacon wasn't born yesterday. He fled and turned himself immortal. To his dismay, immortality only extended to longevity, not eternal youth. His body continued to decay as it otherwise would, and thus here he was now, a living mummy. The living mummy continues his nap after waking up, however, and so the team moves on to the chapel, just as the clock strikes midnight. A new day. That new day is All Saints' Day. A day of strong spiritual energy, which spawns a powerful gargoyle demon who, in the ensuing chaos, manages to split the trio apart. Kudelka is left to fend for herself, and so, alone, finds Ogden and Patrick's little underground torture chamber. I do not like this. Overwhelmed by horrible visions of death, Kudelka is knocked out by Ogden, only to wake up to him sharpening his axe and calling her every name under the sun. But as he swings his axe to strike the final blow, he is instead shot by his own wife, who's had enough of all the killing. She calmly explains her husband's history before turning the gun on herself in the end. We should stop this conversation now. My husband is waiting. He can be so impatient, you know? After freeing herself from her bonds, Kudelka finds her two friends again, except they're on different sides of a wall. While searching for a way to rejoin them, she visits the graveyard and runs into Roger Bacon, the living mummy, once again. Now slightly more lively than before. He's a bit of a strange one for sure, but he's, he's nice enough to open a gate back to the monastery for Kudelka. After explaining what happened to Edward and James, and James in turn explaining more of his history with Patrick, the Scooby Gang finds Roger Bacon, once again, rummaging through the library. He throws the great book of exposition at us, but seems helpful enough in general. At this point, we finally have access to Patrick's private quarters, which also contains a painting of Elaine, which Kudelka uses to contact her, so the two men by her side can see Elaine's ghost for herself and hear her plea for help. After asking Bacon how exactly they'd go about destroying the Tree of Life, coincidentally, it involves throwing the mummified arm of a saint into the Cauldron of Life and setting the whole place on fire, we finally make our way to the flower blooming at the top of said Tree of Life and confront the monstrous Elaine. There are three separate endings, technically, to Kudelka. During the game, you can find a pendant, Kudelka's pendant specifically, that protects you from evil. If you did not find this pendant, you die. Ah! Don't worry, if you missed this item, you can actually get it as a drop from a black cat just in front of the boss area. In finding the pendant, Kudelka will use it to protect the group from Elaine's initial attack. After that, Elaine will get very upset.
she'll chase us up the stairs all the way to the top, where we finally battle her for real, and you get two possible endings. If you lose to Elaine, James will sacrifice himself in the mother of all exorcisms, causing a literal deus ex machina, which allows both Elaine and James to ascend to heaven immediately. Fate. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with the sword he will be killed. I am what I am. I am content with my lot. I have always loved you, Elaine. James will die, of course, but Kudelka and Edward heroically jump off the tower and spend a cozy night together, also conceiving a child and all around having a great time. If you defeat Elaine, she crashes through the tower and into the flames to her final death. Everyone survives and James becomes even moodier than he already was. that the ending where everyone survives is the good ending, and indeed, it is noted down as such, but I disagree wholeheartedly. That ending isn't even the canon ending to the game. The bad ending is. In the game following this one, Shadow Hearts, we find James's grave near the destroyed monastery, and we meet Kudelka and Edward's child. Yes, everyone lives in the good ending, but James isn't happy. Neither are Kudelka and Edward, honestly. The mood is dour after the fight is over, an air of sorrow surrounding the three. Whereas in the bad ending, James finds his redemption at last. He too felt a great deal of guilt weighing down on him after learning of Elaine's death. He loved her, after all. And now, in death, he was allowed to sacrifice himself to save not only his immortal soul, but that of Elaine as well. James is not a good person. He's one of the worst kinds of people, in fact, and his final act does not absolve him of all he's done, but it shows a willingness to atone that, as it seems, is enough to allow him entry through the pearly gates. Symbolically, one might even assume that in not sacrificing himself, he condemns Elaine's soul to hell. After defeating her in combat, she falls downwards into a literal sea of flames. It cannot get more on the nose than that. Her soul was damned the moment Patrick pulled her back from the afterlife, and only through James's sacrifice did she find redemption alongside him. It isn't a new concept for evil people to condemn the souls of those they love to eternal damnation through their own selfish acts. Patrick certainly was not beyond that in his bid to play God. The creature is a good example of that. There is an optional zone in this game that holds a being known only as the creature. It's a pitiful entity, unable to leave or die. Gameplay-wise, it is only here to give the player hints on what to do next, but story-wise, well, he has a few interesting quotes, and I'm only sad he doesn't have a voice actor. I just worked here. Patrick hired me. Patrick, how could you do this to me? He was once a man hired by Patrick and eventually experimented on, no doubt in preparation for Elaine's resurrection. An innocent man, not just sacrificed, but cursed to live out a non-life here, underground, alone, surrounded only by corpses. Patrick, while he may once have been a good, upstanding man, threw his morals to the wind as soon as his selfish needs surfaced. 
because let's be honest, he did not resurrect Elaine for the sake of his wife. He resurrected her for him. He couldn't live without her, and so he tore her from her eternal sleep to be with him once again. And make no mistake, Patrick believed in God very strongly. In his research notes, he constantly talks of the Lord. He noted that he was aware that his act could prove insolent in the eyes of the Lord, but asked him to turn your eyes away for a short while. In the very next note, he admits that he may burn in hell for his sins, but it did not matter to him. Never once did he stop to think that he dragged his wife into this with him. His wife, who had no agency in the whole affair, and even told James, who also wondered about perhaps trying the resurrection again, that her death was preordained by the Lord. She didn't want any of this, and yet Patrick never considered that she might not want to come back. Kudilka is a tale of three individuals, each trying to find themselves. Throughout the game, they face their fears and overcome them to emerge anew by the end. James sacrifices himself for the good of another, finally letting go of the idea that Elaine could be his one day. Edward found himself fighting for something other than petty distractions and cheap thrills for the first time in his life. And Kudelka... Kudelka found not only love, but conviction that her powers were a source of light for others, and she would continue to use them for good. In Shadow Hearts, we do meet her again, although in a far minor role. If you enjoyed this story of Kudelka, perhaps you'd like to hear of Shadow Hearts one day, one of my all-time favorites for a variety of reasons. Let me know. Kudelka is a very interesting game. It has all the hallmarks of ye olden games that I still enjoy very much. Strangely powerful optional bosses in the Gargoyle that reward you with strangely powerful weapons like the Sacknoth, named after the company that made the game that looks exactly like Soul Edge for some reason? Even stranger quirks like saving at exactly 11, 11, 11 hours into the game while holding 10, 21, 32 or 43 items in your inventory to receive a sword literally meant purely to defeat that one strong optional boss. It all seems pointless and weird, but it adds a certain flair that makes you go, well that was pointless, but I like it. Games in this genre are few and far between. In fact, I don't think I know of any newer ones, and quite frankly, I'd like to see more of them created again. Perhaps there simply isn't a market for it, but still, one can hope. It's why I made this video in the first place. Initially to talk about Shadow Hearts, of course, but in general, I wish more people knew about these games. I don't hear about them nearly enough. And quirks aside, I very much enjoy the story and the characters, specifically because nothing and no one is perfect. There isn't really an antagonist to begin with. Yes, Patrick was a selfish fool, but he wasn't trying to destroy the world. He actually thought that what he was doing could work. Elaine, the final boss, was an unwitting victim of Patrick's hubris. The protagonists themselves aren't any different. Most JRPGs will tell you that the typical archetypes in your party have one or two flaws. Someone's too loud or someone lacks the confidence to find their strength. But in Kudelka, well, they all have inherently selfish goals. They are their own antagonist. Kudelka perhaps the least so because helping others is the only way for her to feel alive, whole as it were. And her biggest problem is that she can't let anybody in. She's built walls around her heart. Her need to help isn't a bad thing inherently, but she's still largely there looking out for herself, trying to fix herself, find her way. Yet progressively worse with Edward, who was just looking for cheap thrills, a new adventure, riches perhaps. And James, well, while he was on a mission from God, we all know the type of person he was. Throughout the game, these characters slowly change. Kudelka finds a strange group of friends and eventually bonds with Edward. Edward finds that perhaps cheap thrills shouldn't be the end goal in life. And James, after realizing that maybe not everyone he doesn't like or doesn't know is a heathen or a pagan or bad person in general, is willing to sacrifice himself for the lives of his friends and the soul of his childhood love. The fact that God is proven to be real in that final moment is meaningful, especially for Kudelka as well. From the start, James had harped on the girl for being a pagan and a heathen for lacking the true faith. But as God is an existing force in this world, 
it stands to reason that God approves of Kudelka as well. James draws his magical strength from his faith, Kudelka draws another from hers, and each are equally valid. There is no judgment, only forgiveness and acceptance. I don't want to categorize the two endings as bad or good, just different. Although for me personally, the one where James dies is more fulfilling to complete the arcs of the various characters. The game never truly has a fully happy ending, and that's okay. I appreciate that it made me think about what had happened in the game and what the ending means for everyone involved. That's what I want to see more of. Games that make me think. And with that, we've reached the end of our story. If you appreciate games in the vein of Kudelka in general, I can wholeheartedly recommend Ragnarok's channel. He was the voice of Patrick Hayworth in this video, and I cannot praise his videos enough. In conclusion, James is still the worst. I do not like this. Until another tale finds us. Wall guy, priest, picked up in Hatcham, broke my arm and most of my legs, sacrificed on Wednesday, 12 p.m. Robertson, innkeep, near the Thames, kicked my privates and pulled out half my hair, sacrificed Monday, 6 p.m. Lokmuin, accountant, Charing Cross Station, stabbed me seven times, bit my arm, nearly escaped, sacrificed Thursday, 1 p.m. Kulsta, baker, Globe Town, beat me with large frying pan, reminder to check on head wounds, sacrificed Friday, 7 a.m. Septic, rat catcher, Vauxhall Gardens, set an army of cats on me, escaped, reminder to redouble efforts. Mike Sears, tollkeeper, Ratcliffe, laughed at me and ran away, must do something about this losing streak. Adrian Packle, bone setter, Biscuit Town, hired help had to save me, broke more bones, may ask him to fix me before sacrifice, sacrifice Sunday, 3 p.m. Ray Ray, pawnbroker, Devil's Acre, shot the hired help. Might just sacrifice their bodies instead, while they're still warm. Freeman, constable, Battle Bridge. Grave mistake. Thought beggar, ran for my life. Getting out of this business before I require resurrecting myself.